So if you have downloaded and installed Anaconda and you now want to try it out, I would search for Anaconda from my start menu. That's a little bit different, or maybe Windows 8 or 10 or whatever, but it's pretty similar. Somehow find Anaconda Navigator. That'll launch a little splash screen here in a second, and that'll let us choose different environments for executing Python code or doing Python work. Um, we're gonna choose, in the first time you boot it up especially, this may take a little while and it will have some update options and it's doing some various stuff. And mine's probably running a little slower because it's a guest OS and not running directly on my hardware. Um, so give that just a second. Uh, when it comes up, I'm gonna choose the Jupyter Notebook. Um, I really like that and I think my students have liked it. I think it's great, especially if you're just starting out but I don't think there's anything that means that you can't um, use it generally. Um, you can decide whether or not you wanna send them feedback, whatever, whatever. Um, I guess I will. Um, and it's gonna ask you, depending on when, when you what you downloaded and what you installed, do I wanna update it? I'm just gonna let it remind me later. So the Jupyter Notebook, like I said, is the main interface that I'm gonna suggest. It's gonna start a server on your computer that's only accessible to your computer, it's not a server that's on your, that's available to, uh, shouldn't be visible to other computers around you. Um, and then in here is a file browser, and for example, if I just wanted to go to a new Python 3 window, I now have a place where I could execute Python code. So if I said, for example, and you're typing in cells, the thing that's a little weird is that if I hit, and if you saw that, I typed A equals seven, I hit enter, it gave me a new line. I typed B equals three, I haven't actually executed that code. You hold down shift and hit enter to actually execute it. And now I could say, tell me the value of A, tell me the value of B, and then I could add them together. And so I have the ability to execute whatever Python code I wanna execute. And like I said, as many items as I want can be in a cell and I don't know, just doing some stuff. And that is a Python list. We'll talk about lists in just a minute and I can go back up here and I can uh, grab an item out of a list or a slice of items out of a list or whatever. Um, and so I have at that point basically functioning Python. Um, but I also have scientific Python. One thing that's gonna get a little weird is there's gonna be a few lines as a scientific Python user, engineer, person that I always wanna have available to me. Um, and so they make a templating system that makes it easy to do this kind of thing, but what I've done is, I'm just gonna copy and paste from my Mac. I've taken my uh, three most commonly needed chunks of code I'm gonna start a new IPython notebook. I'm gonna paste this code here, and then I'm gonna save this um, as default commands or something. Um, and then I'm just gonna bookmark it in my, however your browser allows you to do that. And then what'll happen is whenever I need that, I just go over here and grab, so if I'm in, I think I'm in Chrome, if I said, give me a new tab, the toolbar automatically comes up, then I would just, oh, don't do me like that. Oh, you're killing me. So I gotta save it first. Then if I came over here and reloaded it. Okay, so that's not how it's supposed to go. But this should come up, and then I would just copy and paste that from my default notebook into any other notebook that I started. So if I happen to grab some new Python notebook. I would just execute that code. Um, so matplotlib is the plotting engine that's behind scientific Python. Inline, I'll show you that in just a minute, uh, means that we're gonna not create separate figure windows, but we're just gonna show the figures in line with the code, which I think is really helpful because you're not always trying to figure out which figure number goes with which code and whatever. And then numpy is our, um, matrix toolbox kind of thing. So if I created a time vector, so NP refers to numpy dot a range, which means create a floating point range of values from start to stop using this step. And then if I wanted to make it execute the value, I could do that or echo the value, I could do that. 
So you notice it goes in steps of 0.101. It might be a little weird to you that it stops one step ahead of time, but that's the Python convention that you should be aware of. And then I could um, create a sine wave that goes with that, and then I could create a figure, and I could plot that figure in line like so. And then if I wanted to go back and modify that figure in some way, for example, giving it an X label of time in seconds and a Y label of, I don't have anything fancy, Y of T, like so. And so I have a basically functioning Jupyter notebook with scientific menu or an engineering modules installed. I have this default saved as a bookmark so that if I ever just need to get to those commands, I can simply create a new tab, go to my bookmarks toolbar, grab those and copy and paste them into a new notebook. Uh, so yeah, that's the Jupyter Notebook interface. I'm writing code in, in as big or small a blocks as I want. I'm looking at the output of that code or generating figures. I think it works really, really cleanly. I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, from here, I think you're, you have a basically installed scientific engineering Python ready to go, and you need to learn how to use this. You need to learn how to do some basic Python stuff like for and if and while and defining functions and those kind of things. And then you could go deeper into understanding how to do the scientific toolboxes and NumPy and Matplotlib and SciPy and those kind of things. So look for those in future videos.